All right, then with that, let me introduce our, our guest speaker, um, Alfonso. Um, thanks so much, Alfonso, for being here with us. This is a really uh, special lecture and we uh, it's a pleasure to have you here and it's a great opportunity for us to learn more about my microorganisms. Uh, so Dr. Afonso Pineda is a biologist. He uh, has a master's degree from the National University of Columbia, Colombia and a PhD from the State University of Maringá, Brazil. Uh, this is where he is currently working. And uh, he has experience working with ecology of aquatic environments, including lakes and rivers, and addressing the effects of dams and the reservoirs on diversity. And today he will be going over uh, microbes and plants and small things in water. And so you guys, uh, let's do this like very informally. Uh, feel free to ask questions, to participate, type in the chat as we've been doing. And with that, I'm going to turn into Alfonso. Yeah, thank you, Caroline. I appreciate your invitation and it is nice to be here with you. So uh, please let me know if you are understand me. <laughs> and if you are any question, you can ask in, in any moment, okay? In the microphone or in the chat. I now, now I, I, I can watch the, the chat in this moment, okay? So let's go. So in this lecture, we have, uh, we will talk about microbes, okay? Aquatic microbes, microorganisms. This is the lecture outlined. We will talk about bacteria, the uh, prototypes, and in the case of these prototypes, we are talking about these five groups of eukaryotic algae. The learning objectives of this lecture. Uh, my intention with this lecture is that you, at the final of this lecture, you will can recognize some morphological aspects of the autotrophs, the microbes, uh, why these microbes are important for the, for, the, for the ecology of the environment, the environment and for humans the main drivers of their distribution are their abundance and why they can be a problem and why that problem can be our responsibility okay here we have we can see a uh, tree life with a lot of lineages and in this lecture we are talking about autotrophs in a special the microorganisms so we are talking about these groups, the bacteria group, protist group, and green algae. And we can also find this uh, functionality, this capacity to do photosynthesis in green algae and red algae, okay? But in this presentation, we are talking about only in the microscope organisms. Uh, before talk about uh, this, Organisms, uh, I want to introduce you this, these communities that we can find in the aquatic ecosystems and are very important to know, uh, to understand uh, the drivers and the spatial location of these communities. Three groups, plankton, periphyton and pleuson, okay? We have, for, for instance, the plankton are tiny organisms that live at the mercy of the movement of water, like the zooplankton, it's a copepod. And they can't control where they are taken. 
in the water. They present limited movements, especially horizontally. But in some cases, some planktonic organisms uh, can control their position in the vertical axis in the water column, uh, like some cyanobacteria or like some zooplankters. Uh, in the case of cyanobacteria, they have uh, gas vesicles, and with these gas vesicles, these microorganisms can travel through the water column from the bottom to the surface, and again from the surface to the bottom, depending on the on the daily dynamic. Okay, so a uh, simple reasoning that we can establish here is that uh, fishes and other animals can swim against the water flow, the direction of the water flow. For instance, fishes can swim from, from the upstream to upstream regions, but uh, plankton can't. This is very simple, but it is basic to understand the dynamics and the drivers important for these communities, the plankton. Another community, uh, the periphyton. Periphyton is the material growing on submerged surfaces in the fresh waters. Sorry. Uh, we can also refer to this periphyton as biofilm. Here we have a substratum and a lot of organisms growing in this substratum. And here it's important to, to understand that these communities that we are talking about, uh, periphyton and plankton are not isolated, but related each others. Like in this case, we can see this periphyton is uh, in contact with this plankton community. Okay. Uh, The substrate where periphyton can grow can be, like in this case, uh, some plants. Here we can see these tiny algae or diatoms growing on, on a macroalgae. But also this periphyton can grow in rocks, for instance, or on some animals. And finally, this community, the pleuston. The pleuston refers to the organisms that live, that live at the air water interface. Like in this case, this macrophage floating in the, in the surface of the water column. And also we can, we can find in this region some microorganisms like cyanobacteria are even animals like gast gastrop gastropods, gastropods. Okay, so I will talk about each one of these communities, the groups, uh, about the ecological importance, and if they belong to the periphyton, pleuston, or, or plankton. okay? So the bacteria, are single cell organisms without organelles or nucleus. And this means that all the bacteria are prokaryotic organisms, okay? They are ubiquitous and may have a greater active mass than any other group of organisms on Earth. Ubiquitous, this means that we can find bacteria from the tundra to the Caribbean, for instance, and even in extreme environments like the geysers, okay? And more information about bacteria. A again, a bacteria are in every habitat, and this is very important for of the bacteria. They regulate the flows of energy and nutrients through aquatic ecosystems can only culture uh, less than 1% of all the species and most identification is based on metabolic or chemical characteristics. These two features make it uh, challenging to identify 
the bacteria that we can find in a certain place, for instance, and also know the properties and the products that can be produced from bacteria because the culture and obtain a high biomass of some bacteria is very difficult. Uh, cyanobacteria is, is important in the nitrogen fixation and they are autotrophs, okay? And they have an important role in the detrital food web and in the microbial loop. Here, I will show you how the bacterial loop, loop works, okay? In a general way. Here we have the example of a classical food web in an aquatic environment. So we have the, the base of this food web, the phytoplankton that take the sunlight and with the nutrients, the phytoplankton uh, may make biomass. And this biomass is useful for zooplankton and fishes. Okay? This is the flux of the energy and, uh, and matter. But some of this energy and matter uh, created by the phytoplankton can be lost okay, in the form of dead cells into the dissolved organic matter. But this lost energy is useful for bacterioplankton. Bacterioplankton can feed fits on this dissolved organic matter. And in this way, bacterioplankton create a biomass and this biomass again is is useful for the, another microplankton and in this way this loss energy can return to the food web so this is the main idea here that these these microbes do a bilevel this loss energy to the upper levels in the trophic web Okay, the com communities where we can find these bacteria are the pleuston or neuston aquí, uh, here, in the plankton, and also in the periphyton, we can find the bacteria. Uh, within the group of bacteria that we can find in aquatic ecosystems, cyanobacteria are quite an important part, okay? So we are talking about a little more this group. Oh, here we, we have this, this photo. This is a high biomass of cyanobacteria. And here we can see some species of cyanobacteria, filamentos of cyanobacteria. In this case, in this level of high biomass, the cyanobacteria is in the water-air interface. So in this, in this case, we could relate the cyanobacteria to the pleuston, okay? Some characteristics. Uh, you can see some parts of this presentation later, so I will talk about the, the main topics, okay? Uh, cyanobacteria are known also like blue-green algae. Again, they are prokaryotic. They produce oxygen, and they can do photosynthesis. So functionally, cyanobacteria is like a plant. They can fix nitrogen. Uh, their population, this is very important, population explode with high concentration of nutrients, especially phosphorus. And they produce unpleasant odors, taste, and toxins. We are talking a little more later. And this is an interesting adaptation of this group. They have the ability to do photosynthesis at low light levels because they are they are autotrophs. They need light to to create their their, their food. Well, uh, cyanobacteria has a greater active mass than any other organisms on, on the earth. For instance, while the humans, the taller of humans, represents uh, 350 million tons in dry waste, 
the, the cyanobacteria uh, reach one billion tons. It's a lot of biomass. This is the oldest group of photosynthetic organisms with a fossil record. We have this as evidence of the existence of the ex existence of this cyanobacteria for for many billions of years. The stromatolites, okay, the stromatolites. Cyanobacteria was important for the raising the concentration of oxygen in the atmosphere. And this allowed the establishment of aerobic organisms, mainly eukaryotic. Because in the primitive earth, in this primitive earth, uh, they didn't exist atmosphere, okay? So the concentration of oxygen, the free oxygen was zero in the atmosphere. Uh, and this means that in this primitive earth, didn't exist ozone layer, okay? This means that in this extreme environment, the, radi the ultraviolet radiation had an important and negative effect on the first organisms. But cyanobacteria increased the oxygen to the low the, the creation of this ozone layer, okay? And in this way, another organisms could to, to establish on, on Earth. To this change in the concentration of oxygen in the Earth from a low concentration to a high concentration of free oxygen, this is known as the grow great oxidation event. Okay. And two characteristics from the cyanobacteria were very important to, to survive in this extreme environment. First, this uh, pigment in the sheath of the cyanobacteria. I don't know how to pronounce <laughs> cytonamin. I don't know. I don't know. And this, this acts like a sunscreen. So uh, this pigment still today protects the cyanobacteria from the ultraviolet radiation. And then other characteristics is the, the, the presence of mucilage. The mucilage of the cyanobacteria, again, protects uh, protects again the ultraviolet radiation and uh, from the desiccation. And with this mucilage in, in the primitive earth, the cyanobacteria create uh, these stromatolites. Okay. And some morphologies from this group. From this group, we can find filamentous colonies and unicellular form. Unicellular form is the oldest uh, growth form of this group. Some examples or filamentous here. They can see they can be single, or like in this case, ramificated. Okay. Another examples of another filamentous of cyanobacteria here. But here we can see some cells with different form. For instance, here and here are different from the other cells. And here we have a we have one structure called aerotopes. This is a they are gas vesicles. In the microscope, you can see this structure like uh, pink points, pink balls. Okay. And this is as gas vesicles, and this allows the so we have another uh, akinet here and the heterocyst. This akinet is a um, resistant is a resistant to cold and desiccation. Okay. This structure accumul accumulate. Uh, 
and store I know story. This is a structure, the kinet actually can accumulate and store various essential materials. And both of which allows the akinet to serve as a survival structure for up to many years. However, these akinets, akinet are not resistant to, to heat. Okay? The, de the, de the development of this structure is usually triggered by unfavorable conditions such as insufficient light or nutrients or change in temperature and lean levels. Once the conditions come back in it, can then germinate back into a vegetative cell. And this is the structure that allows the size. Another form, growth form, the colony and the unicellular. And here we can see these characteristics of the cyanobacteria, mucilage, okay? That prevents from desiccation in some environments and, and helps to allow the grazing in some cases. And this mucilage, uh, you can find this mucilage in colony and unicellular and in filamentous species. Yeah. A greater number of the species prefer lentic and nutrient rich environments with high temperatures. Okay? This synergy in between the increase in nutrients and temperature cause blooms of cyanobacteria. A bloom is a uh, the growth and the high biomass of these organisms in environments with high nutrients. This is an, uh, an example of my high biomass of cyanobacteria in Uruguay. You can see the lot of uh, the, how much uh, biomass these tiny organisms can produce. This is from a marine marine environment, but the, the same situation we can find in the freshwater ecosystems. So this high biomass can cause some problems, including the increasing the concentration of cyanotoxins, because some in reality most of the blue green algae produce toxins especially during periods of high nutrients and algal blooms. And these cy cyanotoxins uh, are some of the most powerful natural poisons. Okay. And these uh, cyanotoxins can be bioconcentrated for some organisms. And in this way, uh, they can influence many, many different types of animals in different uh, trophic levels in the food web, okay? Little fishes and high fishes that feed on these little fishes, for instance. Toxins uh, serve as protection against zooplankton grazing, but because it's a poison. But it's interesting because the origin of this toxin, of this cyanotoxin, was not related to any effect of zooplankton because as you can suppose, the origin of cyanobacteria, cyanotoxins was earlier to the origin of zooplankton. Okay, okay toxins uh, affect environment and also the human health. In some cases, it's more easy to know if we have a problem with cyanobacteria, like in this case. We can see a high biomass of cyanobacteria, the soup, green soup, and we have some dead fishes. So we can know that we have a problem with these organisms. But what about this case? What about it? We have this situation here. Okay. It's difficult because even if you can see a clear water, it is possible that you have uh, a high concentration of cyanotoxins, okay? 
because maybe the biomass disappeared, but the cyanotoxin were released to the environment. So let's suppose that we are in the nature in an, in a, an emergency, we need to drink water for some environment, for some lake or river or reservoir, okay? So we could think in, to purify this water, we could, could think in boil your own carbon filter to purify the water. Uh, here, here, boil and the carbon filter. But these methodologies are not enough to eliminate the cyanotoxins. First, here in the case of the boil, because boil can block the cells and release the toxins and increase the concentration of the toxin in the water. And in this case, the problem is worst. And on the other hand, the carbon filter can't catch uh, the small molecules of the cyanotoxins. In this side of the Environmental Protection Agency, they explained what can I do to, to clean the water from cyanotoxins. And they explain here, for instance, that applying the wrong treatment could damage the cells and result in the release rather than removal of cyanotoxins. Okay? So if we have a problem with cyanotoxins in a reservoir, for instance, or a lake, we must to determine the determine the, 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 the correct treatment that we need. Okay, can cyanotoxins form an oxy water? A speci a cyanotoxin the, do not transform the water from an oxygen state, oxygenic state to an anoxic, but they have concentration of, of the high biomass, in this case, of cyanobacteria. All these biomass can go to the, can sink to the bottom. In the bottom, another, bac bac um, another bacterium can eat on this uh, dead, on this organic matter. And in this process, this bacteria can consume the oxygen and then decrease the concentration of oxygen in the water column. So the concentration of cyanotoxin is a serious aspect of water quality because a high concentration can cause the death of the water consumers. Did you hear about the elephants that died the, the last year? No, nobody. So. This is very sad. A lot of elephant died in Botswana. And it seems that uh, cyanobacteria was the, the killer, okay? But uh, the evidence is not conclusive, but we can't discard the effect of cyanotoxins because in these environments, the probability uh, to find high cyanobacteria, biomass of cyanobacteria is high. And also because these animals, these elephants can drink a lot of water every day. So we can, they can concentrate the cyanotoxin in the bodies. Um, we have evidence of the devastating effect that cyanobacteria, cyanotoxins can have, okay? We have here the sad history in Brazil where 126 people were exposed to high concentration of cyanotoxin in a hemodialysis unit. Okay, what other factors could be killed elephants? In that, uh, art, in the, in, in that paper, the researchers talking about that maybe another kind of poisons, but one other kind of bacteria, but it's not, the evidence is not conclusive. Okay. 
Okay, here, the, the water used in this clinic for the general functioning and for the hemodialysis treatments was usually taken in an RV reservoir. Okay. And this water was taken by truck. When this truck arrived at the clinic, the water underwent a purification treatment based on carbon filters. So <laughs> as we saw, carbon filters are not enough to purify the water from cyanotoxins. So these people were exposed to a high concentration of cyanotoxins in the hemodialysis treatment. And then the result was that 51 people died. Okay. Some people died a few days after the hemodialysis and other several, uh, several weeks later. And for several weeks, no one knew what was happening. And after several weeks and takes mates in another countries, like there in the United States, uh, was discovered in the best. Okay. Here the mess is this cyanobacteria are, in, are organisms are organisms present in all ecosystems. Okay. They are normal component of the of these communities. But the problem is when in some site the concentration of nutrients is high and these organisms can develop high biomas, okay? But cyanobacteria can also establish positive relationships with another organisms. As in the case with some plants, this is a symbiotic relationship where the cyanobacteria share nitrogen with the plant and the plant <clears throat> offers a uh, appropriated microenvironment for, for this plant, for this cyanobacteria. As in the case of this capacity to fix nitrogen, make cyanobacteria natural fertilizers in rice fields, for instance. Here we have the, the photo of a uh, heterocyte, the structure that fix the nitrogen. Okay. okay. Let's go uh, talk about the protoctis. In the case, all these organisms are eukaryotic. Uh, no, they do things. Okay? The ectophyte or golden algae, they are flagellated. This means that this algae group presents gelum. Uh, they present of an uh, electronic microscope, the scales. So this means that this group depends on the concentration of silica. Okay? And this is an interesting characteristic of photosynthetic organisms because although these organisms do photosynthesis, they can also ingest particles. It's like an, it's like a, an animal that can do photosynthesis. So, uh, this is not, not like miso mixotrophic, okay? They are that they can grow in oligotrophic environments. Oligo means little, few, and trophic nutrients could be, so, okay? Environments with low concentration of nutrients. We Forms we can identify in this group. We have unicellular forms, we have filamentos, and we have colony. And here is easy to see the, the flagellum in these organisms. Okay. okay. This is a lorica. And here, the lorica, inside the lorica, we can see the, the cell of the organism. Uh, similar to cyanobacteria. Hey, Alphonse. Can... Oi. 
just a quick cut because uh, I don't know if you guys, I missed him for a little while. Is my connection bad or did you guys, was fine for everybody? Like the last two slides maybe. Sometimes you are getting, uh, it's really sharp. Yeah, sometimes we are, we are missing you. I'm not sure if it's my connection or yours. Yeah, it's cutting out a bit. Okay. Yeah, probably just. I try to stop my video to. Yeah, maybe your video. I I will always. Yeah, my stop. connection is is very bad. <laughs> <laughs> I will stop my video as well because I don't know. As I am the one streaming, maybe. Will you stop my. Okay. Uh, can you can you repeat oh. the main, can you go over the main message for the last two slides or three i don't know okay but just the main message uh, here <laughs> okay here is the presentation of the algae and the important of this group here is that they can they are mysotrophic they can do photosynthesis and they can ingest particles of organic matter, okay? And we can find unicellular forms and colonies. This is the most important. Okay. But in some cases like cyanobacteria, these organisms can cause problems too. For instance, any uh, in September uh, 2009, uh, you had the problem with the uh, bloom of this kind of algae, the primesium parbon. And this high biomass, the increase in biomass, was related to, to the increase in salinity. And this increase in salinity was related to some coal mines. And this bloom of this algae was a problem with the, because the concentration of toxins of this algae killed a lot of organisms. You can see here the, the values, okay? This is the, the killer. And this is interesting because I searched in this Clemson University site, uh, the concentration of this algae in in those days and the concentration wa was impressionant was a high concentration of algae and it was interesting because some weeks after the bloom this algae disappeared because the, oh, the concentration of the salinity decreased also so here a message for cyanobacteria but also for this algae and the another algae in general algae react quickly to environmental environmental change, okay? So because of that, these kind of organisms are good indicators of uh, environmental state conditions. The next group, the Bacillarophyse diatoms, they are abundant in many types, types of fresh waters. And as is the uh, diatoms is the most important group in the marine environments. They present a silicon frust frustule, so they also depend on the concentration of silica. They are present in the plankton, but also in the periphyton, and are useful for paleo paleolimnology. Here we can find some, some growth forms. Here the filamentous, and all these are unicellulars. And in this group, we have two groups, the centrate that show this form and the pinnates show this form, okay? In this case, these filamentos uh, belongs to this group of the centrate diatoms. This is the general form of a diatom. And this is structure, the silica structure is the frostor a hard porous cell wall. And the structure of the atom is similar to a 
petri dish like this. Uh, we have two layers and one layer is superposed on the other. Okay, the, uh, that will be a simple description about the, uh, the frustal. And this external structure protects the, these protoplums, this cellular material from the grazing, for instance, and from the mechanical destruction associated, for instance, to a high turbulence in a river. Uh, this structure of silica is quite ornate. And this ornamentation is useful to determine the taxonomical identity of these species. Uh, in some cases, we need to use electronic microscopes to determine the, the, the identity of the species. And these uh, fruit solve of the diatoms can last for thousands of years in the sediments and can be used in paleobiological studies to know more to know more about the environmental conditions in past years. For instance, you have here the sediments, different depth of sediments related to age. Here the year 400 and here the year 2000. And we have the distribution of the abundance of frustal of different species. We have one, two, three, four, five, 10 species, okay? So we have this information. In the, in the case of this species, Cyclotella stelligera, uh, it's abundant. It was abundant from the year 400 to the beginning of the 20th century. But then it decreased. On the other hand, we have this species, Asterionella formosa, and uh, its abundance increased in the beginning of the 20th century. And we can relate this change in the abundance of the species to the change in the environmental condition. For instance, uh, this increase and this decrease relate to the increase in pH and the increase in the phosphorus concentration. So we can see how the condition in the past were changing. It's, a, it's like a time machine. This dia uh, from this diatom, we can obtain a diatomite. That is a very porous and absorbent rock. And with this material, we can make some like uh, some things like dynamite or also used as fabric uh, construction. Like in this case, uh, this church is located in, in the north of Brazil, the state of Ceara. And the bricks used for its construction were obtained from, from this rock. And this is, that's explained the, the, the white color of this church. It's very beautiful. We can also use this diatomite in the cat litter box, for instance, diatomite, because uh, it absorbs large amounts of liquid and also prevents, prevents odors. And also use like a toothpaste because the abrasive characteristics of this diatomite. The connection is better now? Okay. Better, I think That's so. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is another group, Dinophyse, uh, Dinoflagellates, and Dinophyse, this is Latin, unicellular with two flagella. In this group, all, this, all the species are unicellular. We don't have filamentous or colony, okay? They are common in lakes. Uh, again, this group do not, fit, do not fit comfortably as plants or animals because they can do photosynthesis, but they are also use organic matter in your process. And some uh, are toxic. 
they uh, they are they are more important in marine plankton mass, but in freshwater they are in, in sorry in freshwater they are not very abundant. Okay, they present two flagellum, one in this axis. The, the horizontal axis and another in the vertical axis. And these cellulose plates and fiasma are very important to determine the uh, taxonomic identity of these species. Because the position, the local, local, localization, or the, the size and the number of these amphiasma. And again, in, in Estados Unidos, in the United States, uh, we it was a problem with this kind of algae because the increase in nutrient pol pollution was related or very favored the increase of the biomass of these species and increase also the the toxin in the water with problems with the fishes. Uh, here are some photos with the problem that this algae caused on these fishes, and this is the, the killer, Pisteria piscidida. And these organisms, the high biomass or the bloom of this organism is called a uh, red tide. Okay? Like in this case, this is in the marine environments. But we can find this in the in the freshwater ecosystem also. For instance, uh, did you know the, the history in the Bible that God sent a plague and transformed the, the water in blood? Never? This is very, uh, very uh, history very common for Jewish and Catholic people, okay? So in this history, Moses transformed the water in blood. But in the reality, it could be that just an algae, a bloom of this algae caused the red color in this, in this case. Like in this photo, this is the Nile River and this is Egypt and the red color that this algae can produce at high biomass. Here is a video that you can watch later about the uh, bioluminescence of some species in the marine environment. Did you send these the, these videos, Carolini? Yes. Okay. All the videos that you shared are available on eCampus. Uh, okay, you can. See. Just a quick comment. Hey guys, we uh, it's already 10 21. So we are going to continue here. We are recording uh, the lecture. If you have another class uh, or a commitment, you can leave. But if you don't have anything important, it's almost uh, we are almost done, right, Alphonse? Yes, I yeah. think. 15 minutes. 15 minutes? Yes, I'm all right. I think. Yeah, okay. We we I, I will be here and we are recording. Okay. So uh, some problems of this species is that this toxin can be bioaccumulated for other animals and reach the human, for instance. This is another group, the Glenophyse. Again, this group of algae are uh, mixotrophic, okay? And again, in this group, all the species are unicellular. We don't have the colony or, or filamentous. And they are important in eutrophic lakes and in environments with high concentration of organic material. Some examples here, we, have, we can see the, the flagellum here and the red spot that is characteristic of this group. Another group, the chlorophyse, known as green algae. And this is the most diverse freshwater algal group. A lot of the species, look at this. 
this is the major producer of biomass in the freshwater environments. And uh, this kind of algae produce the, the, the best uh, food for the grazer in quality, high quality of the food. We can, uh, here we have uh, unicellular, colonial, and filamentous morphologies. And this table you can see later some examples of, for each one of these of these growth forms. Uh, in this group, we can also find planktonic species and also periphytic species. Some examples are colony here, a giant algae, and here a unicellular with flagellum. Another species the, of green algae without flagello, flagellum. And for me, this is the group with the most beautiful algae <laughs> and are related to waters and macrophytes, microsterias. In case of filaments, they are typically attached to periphyton and they can dominate environments high this is the gira and this is the way we can see the but it did, in this case this kind of bloom uh, don't produce cyanide uh, don't produce toxins we don't have problem with toxin in this case so uh, the phytoplankton, the phytoplankton, a periphyton that we already saw here, do not belong, do not belong to a unique lineage, but to several lineage. So we can see in this tree life, we can see that here we have the land plants and together with the chlorophyte. But in another lineages, we have another autotrophs, like the diatoms, the dinoflagellates, and the oglinates. So the message here is that this group of aquatic autotrophs are polyphyletic. Here is the distribution of the morphology, of the morphological features that I already show you the four groups and some characteristics that you can review later, okay? So let's talk about the main drivers of microalgae and cyanobacteria. So as they are autotrophs, light and nutrients are essential for, for, for the growth, okay? But grazing and turbulence are also important. Here we have the effect of the nutrients this is a classical example in a lake in Canada. Uh, the scientists in this case take this lake and split in two parts. Uh, in this part, they add uh, phosphorus, high concentration of phosphorus. So as a result, they found that here in the eutrophic condition, the biomass of algae increased and that the composition, the species composition here was different from the species composition here. So in the case of, of this algae, nutrients can control the biomass and the composition of the species because uh, you, have, you can have a species with high affinity for nutrients uh, than, than other, higher affinity. This is a, uh, here we can see the videos related to the grazing. You can watch this later. But the important message here is that grazing is another important driver of this algae community because it can control the amount of biomass of the species and determine the species that we can find in a particular body of water. Because uh, grazers, can feed on particular shapes and size, okay? 
For example, if in a certain water body, predators are feeding on a small organisms, it will be expect then that in this particular site to, to be dominated by larger organisms. Ay, ay. Okay. Another important uh, F driver is the turbulence. Uh, let me a second here. It's a turbulence because that turbulence in the water uh, ecos aquatic ecosystem are related to the sink velocity of the particles. And uh, a an algae must to guarantee to stay in this effort in this photic zone, zone region because needs light. If the algae go to the bottom, uh, it will die because it needs uh, light, okay? So if the turbulence is low, the sink velocity is high, okay? For all the particles, all the cells go to the bottom, except uh, the species that possess some uh, adaptation to stay in the surface, like the gas vesicles in the cyanobacteria. If the turbulence is medium, the water, the sink velocity decrease, okay? And if the turbulence is high, this turbulence allow to, to the particle state in the photic zone. Here are video that you can watch later also. And these macroalgae and bacteria are good indicators of environmental change. For instance, this is a seasonal succession of uh, phytoplankton populations in a lake in a temperate region. And we can see here in the, in the y-axis the abundance of these organisms. So we have that in this season, we have a high biomass of diatoms. But then the conditions change, the turbulence in the water column decrease and the concentration of silica decrease and then another algae can dominate, in this case, the green algae. But again, the conditions in the year change, the, concent the nitrogen concentration decrease and the turbulence decrease and the blue-green algae, the cyanobacteria algae can dominate because they can fix nitrogen and they can fluorine, okay? But the conditions change again and the cycle start again with the increase in the biomass of diatoms. That this change uh, or better, uh, climate, climate change can cause some change in the distribution of phytoplankton. This is a expected effect on phytoplankton of this climate change. First, we expect a decrease in the biomass of the phytoplankton because the stratification of the environment will increase. It means that the turbulence in the water bodies uh, decrease. It decreases only a few quantity of algae or cyanobacteria bacteria can stay in the surface of the environment, okay? And the others sink to the bottom and disappear. Also, the, the abundance of the growth will change with the increase again of the cyanobacteria. And in a general way, it's expect that the size of the cells of all the groups to decrease related to the increase in the water temperature and metabolic rate. This is uh, finally the periphyton in this community. We, we can find bacteria here. This is the periphytic community succession. In the beginning, we have bacteria. Then we have cyanobacteria. 
And then another organisms can be established like algae and some animals. Okay. In this group, uh, mainly domain diatoms, green algae and cyanobacteria. Here we have uh, the example of periphyton from uh, macrophytes. Here we can see these diatoms, filamentous diatoms and unicellular. Cyanobacteria in the case, we have here, for instance, uh, two species, cyanobacteria, filamentous cyanobacteria. This is the way they grow on, the, on rocks and the way we can see when we have high concentration of nutrients and highlight availability. Okay? The problem with this bloom of attached cyanobacteria is that these cyanobacteria can produce toxins, cyanotoxins. Here another example of diatoms. Diatoms can create a high biomass in the attached environments in the periphyton. This is the example of the Dimosthenia heminata or rock snot. But this is interesting because the high biomass of this algae are related to a low phosphorus concentration. It's very different. And the scientists uh, do not why uh, what explains the high biomass in this condition. This is a, a, a invader, an invasive species from the north of Europe. And it is a problem in the south of America and North America. I, uh, you have an, a video talking about this, this problem with this algae. You can watch it later. And finally, this is the green algae. This is the spirogyra, and this is the way we can see the a bloom of this algae and again in the case of green algae in this case uh, we don't have problems with uh, toxins oh, finally i this is my take home message for you these five main ideas first the bacteria and algae are important for the energy and matter uh, flux in the aquatic ecosystem and they use the resource in a similar way, despite uh, they belong to different lineages. And the liability, availability, this is very important, nutrient concentration, hydrodynamic and grazing are the main drivers of these communities. Uh, they can cause problems as, as we, we saw, due to natural events or due to, to humans. And but we can avoid those problems. Again, I appreciate your, your attention here, uh, your invitation, Caroline, Caroline. And this is my contact in case you, you want to contact with me in Twitter or in my email. So if you have any question, I'm here, okay? Okay. Great, Alfonso. Thank you so much. Um, we recorded everything, so it's going to be available. And everybody can contact Alfonso if you have more questions. And also, you know, always reach me out. Okay? So uh, if you guys have questions, we will stay here for a moment. And I will also see you this afternoon in the lab if you need to come see me. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Ah, yo no sé colocar eso. <laughs>